National sovereignty and the language of my country first has made a remarkable comeback of late. In stark contrast to the international order that arose in the post-World War II era, the voices summoning that sovereignty debate lately belong to the United States, Britain, Russia, to say nothing of Catalonia and Spain, and others in other European states. What's going on and where is it headed? Let's find out. In Columbus, Ohio, Randall Schweller, professor of political science at The Ohio State University. In our nation's capital, Roland Paris, university research chair in international security and governance at the University of Ottawa. And here in our studio, Janice Stein, the Bellsburg Professor of Conflict Management in the Department of Political Science at U of T and founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs. Janice, great to have you back in that chair and to our two friends in Points Beyond. We thank you for joining us as well. I want to read a couple of quotes just to get our discussion started here. The first from Vladimir Putin, and it goes like this. What is the state sovereignty? It is basically about freedom and the right to choose freely one's own future for every person, nation, and state. The same holds true of the so-called legitimacy of state authority. We are all different, and we should respect that. No one has to conform to a single development model that someone has once and for all recognized as the only right one. Okay, that was Putin a couple of years ago, and then a couple of weeks ago. Uh, here's Donald Trump at the same podium at the United Nations saying the following, Our success depends on a coalition of strong and independent nations that embrace their sovereignty to promote security, prosperity, and peace for themselves and the world. We do not expect diverse countries to share the same cultures, traditions, or even systems of government. But we do expect all nations to uphold these two core sovereign duties, to respect the interests of their own people and the rights of every other sovereign nation. Janice, you've got the two militarily most powerful countries in the world calling on a respect for everybody else's sovereignty. This is an unusual and new consensus. What's behind it? It's not a new consensus. In fact, it's a hearkening back. To um, when? Nothing in history is a direct analogy. Let me, mm -hmm. let me say that. But certainly, uh, we've lived in a system of sovereign states uh, for more than 350 years. And you can argue that we were in an atypical period um, of liberal internationalism that really begins after World War II, but reaches its apogees in 1990, at the same time as we have a period of hyper-globalization in economics. Mm. So these last 25 years are atypical. They are the anomaly. And what you're hearing in a paradoxical way from very different perspectives from Putin and Trump is the norm, Steve. What, uh, Randall, do you think accounts for, if Janice is right, and she always is, this anomalous time in our world history? Where sovereignty is being challenged Indeed. more than it has in the past? Uh, it probably has something to do with American unipolarity, American dominance, the feeling that America can recreate the world in its own image, this responsibility to protect humanitarian uh, type uh, interventions. Uh, when you're extremely powerful, you can do all kinds of things and try to spread your values. Uh, and that's what I think this is about. Um, that said, I think sovereignty, the norm of sovereignty is as strong as it ever was. And, uh, uh, but great powers are great powers and they've always been able to uh, violate others' sovereignty, uh, you know, if that's what they choose to do. We offered a bit of a checklist, Roland, in the intro, but let me just add to it. We talked about, uh, you know, other European countries, Poland and Hungary are making these noises, Brexit, of course. Uh, Britain talking about taking control, China's President Xi earlier this year saying, no one should expect us to swallow the bitter fruit that is harmful to our sovereignty. Why this increasing interest in my country first and foremost now, as opposed to the period we've just come out of? Well, I think that, uh, you know, Janice and Randy started to provide a list of the explanations. And the fact is, for social scientists would say it's overdetermined. In other words, there are a lot of reasons to explain why we're seeing this right now. Uh, economic changes, automation in many areas, the offshoring of jobs, uh, the uh, effects of migration. Uh, and uh, a general sense, I think, of malaise and dislocation in many Western countries in particular. And that's the surprising thing. It's not at all surprising to hear 
uh, Putin or President Xi talking about uh, sovereignty because for them the international structure of institutions and rules is a constraint for them. For Russia, the EU is a constraint on the expansion of Russian uh, influence in Europe. For Russia, talk about democracy and human rights is a potential threat to the uh, legitimacy of the regime. The really surprising and disquieting part is that the United States, which effectively, with some allies, built this liberal international order and wrote its own values and interests into that order. Now we have an American president, at least, who thinks that that order poses a threat to American sovereignty. That is a big change. It is disquieting. It's a fundamental uh, difference from the previous era. But whether this is a lasting change remains to be seen. You know, one of the really interesting things that we don't talk about uh, often enough, is this is truly a failure of global elites. Um, it is truly a failure uh, of the global liberal order that was promoted over the last 25 years. Because it didn't give. Because it did not pay attention to the people who lost in that process. And the, they are fighting and, back now. And they are. There is a huge backlash fighting back. And it's quite remarkable how tone deaf um, so many were for so long um, because, in their view, history was marching in one particular direction, only more forward toward more integration and the global system with its own set of norms. We, this is the future that we were moving toward. And all the people left out of that vision were just either uneducated, uncultured, and just didn't see the way the world was going. And that's a, a shame on them for it not is. recognizing it. It is. Hmm. It is. So I think the responsibility for the moment that we're in now, um, I think it's a mistake to see this particular president in the United States as the cause of this. He's really the consequence of a much deeper failure. Hmm. Uh, I want to play a clip, if we can, at this moment here. Roland, you were on this program a few months ago and uh, talked about, uh, actually, we we're talking about Christian Freeland, the foreign affairs minister, and the need for uh, her. In, in particular, and I guess the Canadian government in general, to bolster this country's own sovereignty. Let's play that clip and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. The United States will defend North America no matter what. The United States sees Canada uh, and Mexico as as integral to its own homeland defense. And in theory, if we spent nothing on our military, the United States would still defend us. But we would sacrifice sovereignty and independence in exchange. Uh, for that, and that's not tolerable. So she was basically explaining why is it that we have to spend billions of dollars on our military? And she was explaining that in part to liberal voters who probably wouldn't put, uh, you know, massive increases in military spending very high on their list of priorities. Now, Roland, if I can put this perhaps a little overly simplistically, the, the kind of sovereignty you're talking about there is quote unquote good sovereignty. How do we tell the difference between that and bad sovereignty? Well, I think that your question is getting at something important, which is that there are many different versions of sovereignty in play uh, in the world today. Uh, if you're talking about Canada, we have, uh, you know, in recent times used our sovereignty for two purposes. One is to attend to our immediate national interests. Uh, and secondly, to contribute to maintaining a rules-based international system, which has underpinned a, uh, international stability and an open trading system, which has also served our interests and reflected our values. That is a version of sovereignty that doesn't preclude international cooperation or see it as a threat. It's one that enables international cooperation. So, uh, you know, there's lots of different versions of sovereignty in play. When you read, uh, when I read uh, Donald Trump's uh, UN speech, for example, there's a very reactive and uh, defensive and exclusionist view of sovereignty, but there's even more going on there. Uh, because when Donald Trump has used sovereignty, he's often embedded it in uh, sometimes explicit, sometimes implicit references to a different idea of nationalism, which is a nationalism not based in civic ideals, but rather one that is based in a sense of belonging uh, that is rooted in ethnic or uh, racial or religious identity. There is another big difference uh, between two versions of sovereignty. Donald Trump's uh, version of a kind of a blood and soil sovereignty and uh, the Canadian version, which at least since World War II has been one that has been rooted in the notion of an open society in which 
uh, the belonging is based on commitment to a shared set of values, no matter where you're from or who you are. And I should add, that view is still the predominant one in the United States. And Donald Trump represents a very significant uh, portion of the electorate, but it's a minority view within the United States, which is why I say it's not clear whether this shift in American policy towards sovereignty, towards international institutions, is a lasting one. Well, it may be a minority view on this program as well, since Randall, I suspect, I mean, you're the only one who had a vote, Randall, but I suspect that even if uh, Janice and Roland also had a vote, they would not have voted for Donald Trump, as you did in the last uh, election in the United States. You're right so about that. So, <laughs> can I get you to weigh in? I don't know in how on... you know that, but... <laughs> <laughs> can I get you to... I, I, I feel yeah. I'm pr on pretty yes. solid ground with that yeah. one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Can I get you to weigh in on this notion of uh, good versus bad sovereignty and whether you share Roland's uh, interpretation of it? Right. I, I obviously don't share Roland's interpretation, particularly of Trump's version of sovereignty as being blood and soil or ethnically motivated or racially or religious... Uh, I think he's just saying what many people outside the American foreign policy establishment have been saying for years is that America has to define its interests more narrowly. We have to promote what's in the American interest, not some community, global community interest. Um, there is no global community. There is no community interest. There are American interests. And, uh, cooperation for cooperation's sake or multilateralism for multilateralism's sake, nation building, these kinds of things, that's what Trump's against. Many, many people in the United States, realists particularly, I'm a realist, political realist, have been saying for years and years that America should pull back, that we need more restraint in our foreign policy, that we need to think about how are we advancing American interests narrowly defined. and. Um, this idea, it goes way back of foreign policy as social work, for example, humanitarianism, this nation building, these are the things that Trump was against. And that's what I think that that's what he's saying, America first. And if that's nationalism or sovereignty or whatever you want to call it, I, I would call it civic nationalism. I would call it at worst, I say it's it's economic nationalism. Um, but uh but there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that America is feeling much more competition. And I, I actually very much agree with Jan, what Janice said, that globalization failed miserably for lots of people. And um, the consensus in, inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C., whether you were a neocon or a liberal internationalist, was more of the same, more globalization, more international engagement with the rest of the world, U.S. international engagement. And what Trump is saying is, look, we, we, this, it's not a panacea. Globalization is not good for everyone. There are people being left behind. We have to consider how is it affecting America and average Americans, middle class Americans, not just how is it, you know, it, it, how is it doing for people in Davos, the, the types that go to Davos, Switzerland, and think that we should have a borderless world? Okay, let me get Janice to respond to that from this point of view. Do you see a difference between the kind of America first, America in its own interests type of foreign policy approach that Randall has just referred to and America pursuing its own interests but working in cooperations yeah. with, with other liberal democracies yeah. to to make the world a better place. Yeah, see the fun, and so I, I'm, I'm gonna disagree with you, Randall, here, just to, uh, uh, in a way you shaded this problem, because the fundamental question is, is economic cooperation in the interest of the United States? Is a freer trading system in the interests of Canada? Well, it's an easy one for Canada, we're small. We have a domestic market of 30 million people. So when we promote an open trading system, we are promoting our own interests, overwhelmingly in our own interests. For the United States, ever since 1948, it was very clear that it was overwhelmingly in the American interest to fund a global security system because it would reduce the incidence of violence and to create economic growth, first in Europe and then in other places, so that the world would be more stable and the American economy would thrive. Yeah, a market for American goods and exactly. services. Exactly. You need consumers to buy American <laughs> products. When did this really start to change? And here Randall has an important point. It starts to change in the 1990s when China um, joined the WTO, sucks up one million jobs from North America, 
And all of a sudden, there is a competition that begins to develop. And the Clinton era was the last era in, in which it was obvious that an open trading system was wholly in the American interest. So what you're hearing from Trump, if you want to be charitable to him, and there are days that I don't want to be, what you're hearing from Trump is, we need to protect the economic interests of the United States. There are unfair trading practices. When you actually look at what he says, it's most of what he says is remarkably ignorant. Ignore well, there are unfair trading practices. That's there are unfair trading practices, but when you turn around and look at what he's doing in the NAFTA negotiations, for example, it says 50% of the uh, changes the rules of origin, so 50% of content in automotive, in cars, should be from the United States. And the hell with you, Canada and Mexico, if you don't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a remarkably regressive way to think about American economic interests. And, and the best evidence for that, Steve, is the fury of so many American manufacturers. Well, the led, Chamber of Commerce The Chamber of Commerce and led by the automakers. Mm -hmm. So he has a parochial, narrow view of American economic interest. I don't think anybody has any quarrel with the responsibility of the US president to promote American interests, political, security, and economic. The real quarrel is, what does that mean in an age when China uh, is now joined the United States as a global economic power? How do we think about this new global economy? Well, let me put the other side of the argument to Randall, which is, do you see all forms of international cooperation as simply serving the interests of elites? Um. <laughs> Simply serving elites, I, I would say that cooperation is not necessarily a good thing, and but that it's, not it's a very bad difficult. Thing, to, but it, it's a difficult thing to achieve true cooperation. It's harder to maintain. Um, I think the difference between liberals and realists is that liberals see a lot of twenty-dollar bills on the ground. They think that there are all these twenty-dollar bills, and they say, "Why aren't we picking them up?" And that is why is there no why isn't there more international cooperation than we see because both sides would do so much better in the long run but through uh, the mutual gains from trade and cooperation realists don't even see the twenty dollar bills on the ground so to them there is no market failure there is no political market failure Roland would you put all of the following examples in essentially the same us first basket. And I'm talking now about Brexit in Great Britain. I'm talking about an independence movement in Catalonia. I'm talking about Scottish independence as well. Obviously, America is going through its um, primal scream, if you like, of uh, increased uh, us first. Do they all belong in the same basket? I think there are connections between all of these um, incidents, but they're also uh, responding to very distinctive uh, unique um, uh, factors, conditions within each place. If I may, I just want to come back and at risk of piling on uh, to Randall. Um, you know, the, the, the issue here is not a liberal versus realist approach to international affairs. There are plenty of realists, most realists, who, uh, although they agree on the need to put uh, national interests first, and uh, to be to exercise restraint and prudence in international affairs that would look at Trump's foreign policy and do look at Trump's foreign policy and say, this is chaotic, it is ineffective, and it is self-defeating. Uh, lots of realists recognize that there is a benefit to the United States of maintaining systems of cooperation and partnerships that can serve and advance American interests, including by reducing the costs uh, of the United States paying uh, to maintain systems that the United States, whether it's security or trade, that, that advances American interests by having others pay part of those costs. Uh, you know, the, it's a very abstract discussion to talk about whether cooperation is good or bad. The question is whether American interests are served by having members of NATO be paying for part of the defense of that, uh, of that, uh, that part of the Western world. I think the answer is undoubtedly yes. So, uh, you know, this, uh, I think that most realists would look at, uh, at Trump's foreign policy and say, this is uh, self-defeating 
And uh, you know, if, if you want any evidence of this, just read anything that uh, Henry Kissinger has written. Uh, he is no idealist, uh, but he talks about the importance of institutions and also of maintaining the integrity of America's own ideals, which have been written into the system. Janice. You know, just, to, just, to, just to come back for a moment to the question that you asked about the connections between Brexit and what's going on in Hungary and Poland, Catalonia, Poland, Scotland, Catalonia. Scotland, maybe. I think it's really, they are, they are connected in this sense, Steve, that these are populist backlashes. And from everything we know, there are two factors that are feeding into this. And the relationship between these two is not always clear. One is losers from this period of hyper-globalization. That's a big part of it. And the second is societies that have difficulty with waves of immigration. Hmm. Uh, and so those, that explains the rise in the AFP, uh, AFD vote in, in Germany. Germany. I mean, yeah. the million refugees. Is, there's no question that's what pushed the support for the AFD up. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the same as Germany first or America first. And that's mm -hmm. a really interesting distinction. This is anger. This is, we don't like this. This is, this is not fair. But it's not an answer to what's in Germany's national interest but, or what's in America's national okay, interest. Okay, but Janice, does it go beyond that to a point where we clearly, for much of the world right now, we are no longer interested in being our brother's keeper, right? There's no question that there is a, a, a drop, a, a reduction in the sense um, that people have an obligation that extends beyond their borders and that those obligations are limitless. Do you regret that? Yes, um, but it's, it's where the politics of globalization have taken us. And I think everybody needs to learn from that. So a doctrine like responsibility to protect no longer, frankly, and this is not a happy story for Canada, no longer reflects where this country is, much less where the world is. You know, this, our government came to, to power, committed to peacekeeping, but has not gone forward with it. That is not an accident. There was a very careful look at what's in our interest, what are our risks, in a way that would have been, frankly, inconceivable even 15 years ago. Randall, you wanted in. Well, uh, to respond to Roland, uh, most realists that I know uh, would have said NATO is obsolete. I mean, one of the first things that Kenneth Waltz, the father of modern day realism, said uh, after the Cold War is NATO's days may not be numbered, but its years are. Um, wh whether you look at Barry Posen, who wrote Restraint, or John Mearsheimer and Steve Walt, who are calling for America to for retrenchment, uh, most realists think, for example, NATO is obsolete, America should end that. And this is a very old principle in realism that the worst enemy of an alliance is success. So when you defeat the enemy, the alliance crumbles. Um, so victory is a bad thing for an alliance. And yet, what have we seen? We saw NATO expand to Russia's doorstep. And almost every realist said that this would be a disaster, that it would bring to power an authoritarian, revanchist leader like Putin, and that we and would have what? another yeah. Cold War. <laughs> and that's exactly what we've had. And so the, this, non, you know, this idea that, oh, well, cooperation and NATO is, a, is the pillar of this international order that America created and all this, well, I, maybe that's the way, that is the foreign, that's the, the establishment view of foreign policy. And Trump comes in saying NATO's obsolete, and they all say he's crazy, he's crazy. That's not, you know, how can anyone think, say such a, a wicked thing? Well, that, you know, that, uh, that's Americans don't see it like the foreign policy no, that's types not, see it. The, Go ahead, Roland. That's not Equal true, time for Randall. You. Go, yeah. Well, I would encourage uh, you and 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 the viewers of this show to go look up the Chicago Council of International Affairs to see the poll that they conducted recently by Roper, uh, in which they asked uh, the American public a whole bunch of questions relating to international affairs. And when it came to whether Americans support maintaining America's commitment to NATO. Uh, it was 70 percent. And when you break that down by party affiliation, it's still more than 50 percent. And if you look at uh, core Trump voters, it's still over 50 percent, just over 50 percent. 
And, Roland. you know, there are other interesting measures here to look at. I know you've cited the Pew uh, surveys before. All of those surveys actually do not show a decline in internationalism on the part of the American public. They show a spike in a kind of nativist protectionism in portions of the American public. And that's crucially important because, yes, we have to acknowledge all of the things that uh, Janice and, and Randy have been saying so far about the effects of globalization. And yes, it's critically important to address the anxieties that people are legitimately feeling instead of dismissing them. Right. But let's not assume that these attitudes are representative of majorities because they're not. Forgive me, let me jump in. We're literally down to our last couple of minutes here. And I don't, I, I, you know, one of the reasons that we need to care so much about this is as people, even if they're not foreign policy experts, surely know, there is a lot of jar jaw jawing and bellicosity in rhetoric between the leader of North Korea and the leader of the United States nowadays. And Janice, I want, to, I want you to tell us what you rate the chances of war right now. I'm very worried, um, Steve. I'm, I, I, you know, I can't put a number on it, um, oh, be, largely because it's, uh, you know, what am I comparing it to? And, and that's the problem. But I'm very worried. I'm very worried for two reasons. You have um, um, two leaders who are each making worst case assumptions about the other. Um, I just happened to be uh, in the room with a very senior US uh, leader, very tightly connected to this administration. Who's, name names? No, who's absolutely convinced that North Korea intends, as soon as it can, to lob uh, a nuclear tip missile at one of America's cities. Uh, and he, he was no, you know, I tried to talk him down. There was no talking him down. Do you believe that as well? No. You don't believe I that? I do not believe that. I believe that this is a brutish, nasty, ugly regime, but not the first. Uh, but it's kind of, but it's developing, it's been developing nuclear weapons for really starting in the 70s, but it's exacerbated by language like hmm. the axis of evil. Right? Let, me, let me get to Randall here. Uh, and you have an erratic president in the United States. Well, this is why I want to figure which out. It's very R scary. Randall, I think uh, a half a dozen months ago, you suggested the p potential of war was 50-50, was which are not great odds. Oh. Where are you today on that? Mm, I mean, probabilities are always difficult. I think Kennedy said there was a one in three chance of nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I, I, but I would say the, chan the probabilities are, are significant right now because uh, because you have two tempestuous leaders and you have uh, what I really worry about is Kim Jong-un is going to have a lot of yes people around him. I mean, you don't say no to him. Uh, we found out what happens to people who don't smile properly in his presence. So um, the information flow is going to be quite bad and you're going to get a lot of yes people. So the idea that it's unthinkable or that the cooler heads would prevail I'm not quite sure. Now, I, you know, I don't know what will, how this thing will unfold, but, you know, the rhetoric can escalate and um, let me who save, knows? Let me save 30 seconds for Roland. Your view on this. I'm extremely worried about the current situation. We have in North Korea and the United States uh, two thin-skinned, um, uh, impetuous leaders, uh, both of whom have demonstrated again and again that they, they cannot tolerate backing down. And, uh, and so we have the ingredients for an incident to escalate. That's what I'm concerned about. If North Korea moves to test another weapon or missile system, or in a way that the United States sees it as an immediate threat, and the United States decides, Trump decides with his advisors to, uh, to, to undertake some kind of very targeted, a limited military uh, action, which is meant as a signal to North Korea, and that that is viewed by the North Korean regime as an attack upon the regime, in part because Trump is saying that he might just devastate the regime. Uh, I think we have the ingredients for a very dangerous escalation with millions and millions of people just on the other side of the North Korean border as the first victims. I, I don't normally end a program by saying this, but I will this time. I hope you're wrong. Uh, Randall Schweller at The Ohio so State I. University, Roland Paris at the University of Ottawa, Janice Stein from the University of Toronto. Thanks to the three of you for joining us on TVO tonight. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.